Carnegie Mellon University's advanced database systems course is filmed in front of a live studio audience. Um, all right, so today we're now going to start talking about how do you actually start executing queries. Um, so the last two classes, uh, the last two classes were focusing on what the data is actually going to look like, and we were designing our encoding schemes in such a way that when we actually start running the queries, we would minimize the amount of data we'd have to fetch from disk or uh, remote object store and bring that into memory. And we can be clever about encoding our, our data in certain ways that we can ideally process, pro, you know, do our processing on it uh, in its encoded form or in its compressed form. Right? RLE is an obvious one, but there's other, tech, other ways we showed how to do this as well. And so for the, the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about how we're actually going to execute queries. Um, and again, in the OLAP world, it's all about sequential scans. We're not going to do index lookups. We're ignoring bitmap indexes and other things. But there isn't going to be a BBUS tree to go find us single things, single, single records. We're going to have to scan through large chunks, chunks of data. So this is, that, again, that list of the, what I showed uh, a couple weeks ago of here's the bag of techniques or tricks we can do to make sequential scans run faster. And as I said, we're not going to discuss Mitchell's view uh, and, and clustering and sorting in this, this semester. But we've already discussed data encoding and compression. We've already discussed a little bit about data skipping, like how to use zone maps to say, here's the min max of, of this giant block of data, and check to see whether the tuple you're looking for or any tuple that, that's, that could, be, could be in that block based on that and zone map. So for the rest of the semester, we're going to go through all of these. And it's not going to be like, here's a lecture on you know, uh, task parallelization. Here's a lecture on uh, query parallelization. It's going to come up in different, uh, in different points throughout the entire semester. Because sometimes when, We'll, we'll delay discussing certain things, and then we'll have to bring in this, sort of this bag of tricks for discuss how to do joins efficiently or how to do code specialization and other things. So again, we'll go through these uh, uh, throughout the semester. So at its core, what this class is in somewhat really about is how to build a database system to run efficiently on, on your data for, for a given set of queries. Um, and the idea here is that we want to make the full use of the hardware that's available to us uh, so, again, we can run queries fast and, and, uh, and, and at a lower cost than otherwise than just doing something stupid, right? And so all the things I showed in the, on the last slide, there's not one of them I can point to and say, hey, if you're building a brand new system, here's the one thing you want to do above everything else, right? Just, just briefly going back to it, right? All of these things matter. All of these things are going to be cumulative or multiplicative where we, we can add them on top of each other and get, get better results and make things run faster. Um, and so... It's really about understanding from an engineering perspective what are the trade-offs that, that one of these techniques would make, both in terms of the performance costs and actually the engineering costs. Like how much time is it going to take for someone actually to build this and maintain it is another big problem as well. Right? So the spoiler is going to be just-in-time query compilation, amazing results. Right? You'll get, get really fast, but it's a, it's a big pain to maintain and build. And so, therefore, most systems are going to choose pre-compiled pre primitives or, or operations. Right? This is actually what the VectorWise paper, I don't think they didn't mention it in that paper, but it's one of the techniques that they used. So this is not a scientific list of what I think the top three uh, optimizations of, from the previous list. Uh, this is, so these aren't the ones that I think are going to matter most. In the context of query execution, uh, these are going to matter. Obviously, data skipping, like if, if you're looking for a thing that's not in any possible block and your zone map can can help you, help you avoid reading any data. Like, nothing can go faster than that, reading nothing. Uh, but if you actually do have to run queries, these are the ones I think are going to matter the most. So we'll spend a little bit of time talking about vectorization, uh, not actually the vectorized algorithms to do our, our query operators. That'll come in a week. Today is really setting up the query processing model so that we can then feed uh, data in such a way that we can, can vectorize them. Task parallelization, we'll talk a little bit about today, is basically how to take a query, break it up into disjoint tasks and run them in parallel on different cores, different threads, different, different nodes. And then code specialization, again, we'll, this will be a big thing starting next week. Basically, how can we avoid giant switch statements and indirection in, in our database system uh, by having exactly what the query wants to use or the, the instructions, exact instructions that the query wants to use to process the data. Again, we'll, we'll see the two ways to do this. So, at a high level, optimization goals are going to be the, the, the following three things. So in order to get queries to run fast, the most obvious thing we can do is just reduce the number of instructions we have to use to execute it. Right? 
We want to use fewer instructions uh, on the CPU to run the query in the same amount of work. Right? The comp compiler can help a little bit. Right? If you pass in the O2 flag, I don't know what the equivalent is in Rust, but you pass O2 and GCC and Clang, right? it'll, it'll be more aggressive in trying to, to optimize things so that you'll get fewer instructions. Um, as far as I know, people typically don't sh uh, ship production databases with O3 enabled, O3 compilations, because things get kinda, can get kind of hairy. Um, that can reorder things in a way that would be incorrect. Um, and so instead, what we're going to do is try to you know, design our database system, design our execution engine, just, just to use fewer instructions. Uh, and if you don't take my word that you don't want, you don't want to ship O3, this is from the Linux mailing list uh, two or three years ago. And basically, Linus is saying here he thinks uh, O3 is generally unsafe. Um, so again, most, as far as I know, most database systems will, will ship with O2 enabled compilation. All right, so after we've, we've, we've reduced the number of instructions that we want to use to execute queries, the next thing we can do is try to reduce the number of cycles per instruction. Right? And the idea here is that when we actually have to execute the instructions to run a query, we want the data that it's going to need to operate on, to process, to be in you know, L1, L2 cache. Even better would be CPU registers. Right? And that means we want to reduce cache misses uh, due to memory loads and stores. Uh, we want to maximize the locality that, of the data that we're going to process on uh, in, our, in, our, in our operators and in our query plan so that they're going to sit in the CPU caches. And we'll see how to do this through, through pipelining uh, and e more aggressively with operator fusion in push-based uh, query execution. Right? So the, the weird thing about this, not weird, but like the, the thing why this, is, this one's going to be tricky like everyone can sort of reason about this, right? The first one. Like, yeah, run fewer instructions. Don't do stupid things, right? Don't make library calls and start computing pi unnecessarily ready running a query, right? That's obviously stupid, but like, you know, things like that. This one's a bit more tricky, right? And the reason why this can be tricky is because we as humans, the way we naturally write system code or code is not going to be always the best way that the CPU actually wants that code or wants you to run instructions, right? Because the out of order superscalar CPU, which we'll cover in a second, like, the, what is ideal for humans for us to reason about and maintain software may actually be the worst thing for the CPU. So we'll have to look at what the algorithms we're going to use when we run our queries or build our system to make sure that we, we account for what the CPU expects or wants and try to design the code in such a way that it generates that for us. Because the compiler isn't always going to magically do that for us. All right, and the last one is sort of obvious as well, right? We want to parallelize the execution, right? Moore's law is more or less ending. Uh, and we're not getting faster clock speeds, although Intel's more recently is ratcheting that up. Um, but we're going to get a lot more cores. And the cool thing about this is that on, on newer CPUs, there's a mix of like the high performance cores and the efficiency cores. Right? So now we can, in theory, start scheduling things based on one core versus another. And then you throw in GPUs, and those things have you know, tens of thousands of cores, which is insane. Right? So we're going to cover. Um, we're going to cover all of these uh, throughout the next couple of weeks. Today, we'll talk a little bit about how to do this one, the second one, um, and, 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 and this last one a little bit. The first one, we'll see this uh, when we talk about code specialization, so query compilation, and both pre-compiled and, and jitted. All right, so just make sure we're all in the same, uh, using the same terminology of vernacular when we're describing queries and what we're actually going to be executing. Um, you can think of a query plan as a DAG of operators. Right? So here we have a SQL query here, and we converted it into a, a physical plan. So we have scans on the bottom, then our projections feeding to a join, uh, followed by a, uh, that's a projection side, the filters, join, and then projection. So these are the operators that we're going to have in a query plan. And then the, the, the database system is going to convert them into operator instances that are going to be invocations of that operator. Right? And the reason why we have to distinguish between operator instance and operator is because we could have an operator run in parallel. Right? If, if this table is a billion tuples, I could divide it up, uh, this scan operator, into 10 operator instances that are each going to scan different row groups or different, different files uh, in S3. A task is going to be a uh, sequence of one or more operator instances. Again, this will basically be the same thing as pipelines, but not always. It's basically, you're going to recognize that, oh, I can, I, as soon as I do the scan, I immediately want to do the filter, so I can combine these two operator instances together in a single task. And that's what's getting scheduled by the system to run. And then a task set will be a, just a collection of these executable tasks we could have for th this pipeline that we could, we could then ship out to the different cores. 
So the pipelines are going to be an important part of what we talk about today and going forward, right? And so again, the pipeline is the, a boundary in our query plan that specifies how much we can process a single tuple or a batch of tuples or a set of tuples up through the query plan to at some point we reach an operator where we need to see all the other tuples within our, within our pipeline before we can proceed up into the query plan. Right? So on this side here, we're doing the scan on A, then the filter, and assume the build side of the hash, say this is a hash join, the build side here is part of this pipeline. Like I can't, I can't send any tuple up beyond the join until I see what comes on the other side. So assuming I execute pipeline one, again, whether it's a single, op, you know, sorry, a single task or multiple tasks running in parallel, it doesn't matter at this point. And then once that's complete, I can then run pipeline two, and now pipeline two could do the filter. So I do the scan on B, filter it, and then do the probe and the hash join. And now we know that any tuple that matches in the join can then be pushed up to the projection operator as part of the output, right? I don't want to start running the join or start probing the join on, on this, uh, for this query until I, I've populated everything on the, on the A side because otherwise I could have false negatives. Now, I'm showing this in this sort of this pipeline wheel all the way up on one side. That's ideally what we're going to want to do to maximize the, uh, the reuse of data, like to minimize the number of cycles for our, for our per tuple as we go along, but I could have just done the scan on A and then filter it, you know, materialize the output, scan on B, filter it, materialize the output, and then have these be two separate pipelines. And then a third pipeline could then be, okay, let me, let me actually do the join. That's actually would be slow, right? Because you're basically writing a bunch of data between these two pipelines, where it's better off to do a pipeline that tries to get all the way to the top. Again, we'll see why this matters when we start doing uh, uh, you know, f operator fusion and other techniques. Yes? Wouldn't it allow you to potentially start executing the join on another thread, or like another, another CPU core, while you're still executing to uh, filters? So you're saying, that couldn't you start on, on, couldn't you start running the join at the same time where you're still scanning A and B? Yeah, where there would be, there'd be more bandwidth uh, used, certainly, but like, it may be that the whole thing finishes faster because we're taking better advantage of parallelism. So let's say that the very last tuple, ignore parallel threads. So ignore multiple operating instances. One, this thing's running by itself. The very last tuple that you see in A is the only tuple that's going to match in B. But if, I, but if I start probing into this hash table before I finish scanning A, I could have a false negative because I didn't put that tuple, last tuple in yet. Oh, right, yes. Yeah, you can't do that. Just, Wait, go ahead. What's that? Yeah, you're, you're still building A, but you can't check to see whether something exists until it's populated. That's his question. Can you start pipeline two before you start pipeline one? That would be, again, the problem I, just said, I said earlier, where like, if I start scanning B, start filtering it, what do I do with that output? I see. It's got to go somewhere, right? So I, I, I just start writing to, me, to disk and memory, then that's, that's just pressure for, uh, you know, for, for the overall system. Where it would have been, it's a better idea to maybe run this in parallel, populate the hash table, then run B. Okay, so a uh, lot discussed today, but I want to first start talking about the, the paper you guys read. Um, this, you know, this, this, it's an older paper, but it's very important. It's very seminal um, about why the designs of database systems at the time when the paper was written, 2005, are insufficient for, uh, for you know, if you want to run OLAP queries, uh, high performance OLAP queries. Now, you may be thinking, why am I making you read a paper that is almost old as some of you guys here, or like this, you know, what is that? 19 years old now, uh, because that that paper is seminal. Meaning every OLAP system that's that's out today, for the most part, followed the design guidelines that was laid out by that paper. And everything, for, with some exception about the itanium stuff, which we can talk about in a second. Like the core ideas still matter a lot, right? Then we'll talk about processing models, the plan processing directions, uh, whether to do bottoms up or top down or push versus pull. Filter representation, we'll talk about that a little bit of this, we'll talk about it when we talk about vectorization next week, but basically, when I start applying predicates and I start matching tuples and tuples don't get matched, what do I actually store when I go from one operator to the next? And then if we have time, we'll finish up the different modes of parallel execution, right? The idea is, again, we're, we're gonna talk about how do you architect the system so that you can run uh, these operator, uh, these tasks or the operator instances in parallel. Um, and then in a few weeks, we'll then cover how do you actually implement the algorithms within the, the, the implementation itself to do, to do parallel, uh, parallel execution, like for joins and sorting. 
All right, so again, the, the, the MediaDB X100 paper is from 2005, and it's essentially a low-level analysis of the, of, for in-memory in workloads, what, what are the bottlenecks you're going to face when you want to run OLAP queries, right? And the idea, the, the, the big idea, the thing to break through was they looked at all these existing systems at the time and, sh and showed how if you want to run OLAP queries, right, running large scans over uh, and doing joins and so forth, that the existing systems at the time were simply not well designed for the modern out of order superscalar CPU architectures that Intel was putting out at the time, right? And the idea is that if you can redesign your database system to better target for what the CPU wants from you, what, what kind of, uh, you know, if you design the system itself, how data flows through it, what instructions you're calling and when, then you get much, much better performance because you're designing the system in such a way that the CPU is, is, is happier, right? Instead of you as the programmer trying to make things easier for yourself, and which is harder for the CPU, you make life slightly harder for yourself, and the CPU can run much, much more efficiently. So what happened was the, the, the background of the story is that there was this project out of uh, CWI where this paper came from for called MoDB the days in the 90s. And basically they were doing some experiments on it and they realized that, oh, the way, you know, the way they're going to do their processing model and, and send you know, entire columns from one opera to the next, that's terrible for the CPU. Uh, and, and there's all this indirection, things much slower. So they built this X100 prototype. Um, they then spun it out as a startup called Vectorwise that was acquired by Actin in 2010. Um, it got then rebranded as Vector, which I think is a terrible name for a database, because you search Vector database, you're not going to get this thing. You're going to get Weave 8 and Pinecone and all these other ones. Um, but then the cloud version uh, of the Vectorwise is now called uh, Avalanche. Then Actin got bought by, I think, an Indian holding company, HCL, HCL two years ago-ish, yeah. right? And so it's still there. Actin is also the original, is what Ingress became. So Ingress got bought and sold over the various years. And then at some point it got rebranded to, to Actian. And they kept, sort of had these older databases. Uh, and then, then Vectorwise was the sort of the high performance column, column store engine for, for Ingress. And then it got, you know, it got rebranded. Um, but anyway, so again, the reason why, again, I had you guys read this paper, even though it's from 2005, is because this is, you know, this is how you want to design a system even today. Now, there's all this other stuff about Itanium, which I'm assuming that's a CPU architecture that no one, actually, who here has heard of Itanium? One, or three, right? It's basically, it was like, it was another superscalar CPU from Intel that, that in collaboration with HP in like the 2000s. It was meant to replace x86, right? Um, but it had like this, this massive like pipeline. It, was, it, it did things a little bit different than how we, you know, Xeons work today. But it, it didn't go anywhere. They killed it off. And so, We'll see this maybe some other papers too. There's other Intel hardware that people sort of target that doesn't exist anymore. We don't care about. Um, but the high level ideas actually, actually matter. And again, just to show you that this paper, even though it's, it's from 2005, it's still timely. Uh, earlier in this year at CIDR, uh, this paper won the Test of Time Award. All right, so because the, re the database research community recognized that how important this paper was and how this has, has massive influence in, this, you know, in, the, in the database marketplace uh, for OLAP queries. Right, so that's right there. That's Peter Bonds. That's the um, it's the guy that uh, you know it did the early work in ADB, did the work, early work in Vectorwise. Now he's a technically an intern at Mother Duck, but he did early work on DuckDB. Um, Niels is the I think he's the CEO of, of the ADB company. That's Marzin Sikowski. So after Vectorwise got bought by Actian, he then went and formed Snowflake. And a lot of the ideas that are in this paper is what Snowflake's based on. Right? We'll cover him later. Um, that's Magda, Pat Helen, she's at UW, he's at Salesforce. Uh, that's the guy who invented uh, Volker, he invented Apache Flink. Right, we're not going to cover Flink, but anyway. Um, again, this, pa this paper is super, super in influential. All right, so this is sort of a crash course in what CPUs look like and just for like what it matters for us as, as database people. Right, so it's everything you need to know in like two slides um, at a high level. So the the CPU is basically organize the execution instructions through these pipeline stages. And the, and the CPU's basic goal is to try to keep this pipeline uh, busy at all times. Right? There's always something to, to, to do. Right? And so that means that if there are instructions that you can't complete in a single cycle, it's going to try to keep executing things in the pipeline because you know, you, you, there's a cache mesh, it's got to fetch this thing with memory. So it's always going to try to keep executing things. Right? And in a super scalar CPU architecture, there's going to be multiple pipelines running uh, at the same time in parallel, right? 
And so they're going to run slightly out of order, uh, meaning like the instructions may execute differently than the order that they, sh they appear in the code. But then the CPU, at least in the case of Xeons, are going to do a bunch of extra work to make sure that once you get all the data that you needed, uh, you then check to see whether the, 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 the output of those out-of-order instructions would have matched the same as if it ran in order. Right? AMD is, is doing essentially the same thing. Like all the superscalar CPUs are doing, doing essentially the same thing. The GPU cores are not. Yes? Okay. Precisely what does a, is a superscalar CPU? Is it just multi, multiple cores? Mul no, multiple pipelines. Multiple pipelines. So within one core, you'll have multiple pipelines. That, okay, so that's, okay. Yeah. Okay, within one core. One core, yes. But then, what? What CPUs are not superscalar? So what did you say there? The 19, yeah, the 90s. But GPU cores, I don't think, do this as well, right? They're in order. Right, because this, this is actually very complex to do. You're, you're like, basically, it's the same thing as like optimistic concurrent control for transactions. You're, you're assuming everything's going to be okay. You let things run sort of speculatively. And then you just have to check at the end, did it actually match out, right? So this is fantastic, right? Everything works great when, when you get it right. Um, and if, if, if the CPU recognizes that there is a... Uh, like a dependency, like I needed to know the output of one instruction but wanted to do the next instruction, or if I do a misprediction, right? Meaning like there's an if clause, it sees that, and it says, uh, you know, a, a, a branch instruction, it sees that and tries to predict which path down the branch you're going to go, like if then else. So it tries to pick which one you're going to go, and then specially executes whatever it thinks the path that you're going to take. And then if you get it wrong, you have to flush the pipeline and roll everything back and restart. And that's really expensive. So, Again, these failures can occur in, in the two ways I just said about. So one is dependencies, right? If one instruction depends on the output of another instruction, then you can't, uh, you can't immediately put that in, in the same pipeline, right? You have to stall and wait. Yes? Does one pipeline correspond to one core? Because in each cycle, do you take off one work item from each pipeline? No, the question is, does one pipeline correspond to each one core? No. Every core can have multiple pipe pipelines. Um, the pipelines are short. I think like uh, I think the latest Xeons are like twenty instructions in a pipeline. We're not like we're not like in the I think in the in the, in the, the X one hundred paper they talk about how like I think the Pentium fours or one of them had like thirty one instructions. It was insane, right? They they're now more reasonable. But again, if you still have one of these, if if it, if it predicts something wrong, you got to flush the pipeline, undo stuff, and, and and install until you bring back the instructions that you should have executed, right? Right, so in the case of this first one, dependencies, this could occur when there is, you know, if we're scanning a tuple and we need to store the data in an output buffer before we can execute anything else, like we need to know what the result of that computation was before we can go on to do the next thing. Yes? Um, so that's the same pipeline? Does that mean you can push it to a different pipeline? This question, so uh, it says, that the first one says, then it cannot be pushed immediately into the same pipeline. No, because you can't, like, you basically have to wait until you figure out what's going to happen, then you put it in. Okay. Yeah. But I, actually, I don't know whether you could have, like, here's the pipeline I'm really running, but here's the pipeline. As soon as I find out with the first one, then I can run the other one. I don't, I don't know if it does that. I don't think it does. All right. The second one is for branch prediction. And this is basically means that, like, if, as I said, if there's an if clause or some kind of conditional statement, it's going to try to predict what you're going to do. And this part is super sophisticated in CPUs, like AMD and, and, and Intel. Like, this is like the secret sauce of the CPUs, and they don't share what exactly the branch predictor is actually doing, right? Because this is, in, the Intel's is, you know, is very, very sophisticated. Um, actually, they, they all are. Um, so again, the idea is that if we s build our system in such a way that we have a lot of conditionals, we, we may end up making things worse for us because, you know, think of like you're scanning data, you don't actually know what path you're going to take because it's, it's going to depend on what the query is, to, like the conditionals or the, the where clause, depend on what your data looks like. So there's no way, to, that easy way to really predict for every single query what path you're going to take down for different conditionals. Right? So for this last one here, we'll talk a little bit about how to, how to fix it. So again, because we have these long pipelines, we're going to try to expect to execute branches because it wants to stall the, or sorry, it wants to hide these long stalls uh, between these pending instructions and going fetching things from, you know, L3 cache or L2 cache into, into our registers, right? The way, the, the one spot of the data system that's, that's really, this is going to come up a lot is just the basic filter operations when we do sequential scans. 
And as I said, because it's going to depend on the, 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 the filter is basically conditional. Like where something you know, equals something, that's an if clause. And whether or not that, that predicate is going to evaluate to true depends on the data. Right? So this is nearly impossible for, for, for you know, even us as the database system who are actually running the code to predict, let alone the CPU, because the CPU doesn't know anything about you know, what a database system is or what a, what a query is. If anybody know a compiler hint you could potentially use to, to resolve this? I don't know what I had to do it in Rust, but in C++, there's, there's something in the, in the standard. You can call likely and unlikely. So they have these, these, these compiler directors where you can specify whether a, uh, a conditional clause is going to be, or code path is going to be likely or unlikely, right? Uh, C doesn't have this. They, I think they avoided this. Again, I don't know whether Rust has this. Um, and this, this is, uh, I, did, I did some quick searching to see what systems actually support it. ClickHouse has this. I know DuckDB does not because they're trying to be portable. Uh, Postgres has this, right? But the, these are not hints actually to the CPU. You can't tell the CPU, like the, the branch particular, hey, I'm likely to go down this path, right? Uh, I think Intel had, had some capabilities in the early days to do this, but in 2006, they took it out, right? So this is, this is just a hint to the compiler for it, for it to potentially reorganize your code itself so that the likely path is maybe at the top of something, right? And then if you read this blog article from a, I think he's a compiler engineer at, at Intel, he basically says, don't use this. It's going to make, uh, sometimes it's going to actually make things worse, and it's not often going to actually make things better for you, right? So... I think the interesting thing, we take ClickHouse, take all these systems that do use this, like, because they're all just pound of fines, so you can just hide it. You can see whether it actually makes a difference. I have no idea. It, what? It is in Rust. It's, it's unstable. Okay. It's unstable. Okay. Yes? I, mean, I know many people use this, for example, in networking, when you have basically uh, cool data from the net. Yes. Um, yeah. But it's not, but again, it's, it doesn't help the CPU branch pr predictor. I mean, for ASICs, or is it like for like embedded? Is it, what's that? It's for ASICs. No, like the net image, for example, it's clean and it's just like using the net. All right, so, so that's like specialized hardware? I have no idea. I'm for Xeons, this doesn't do it. That's on the CPU. I'm oh, sorry, for the CPU, I, I thought you said FPGA. So, yeah, it's FPGA. Okay, so you're saying for, for the, the network hardware stuff, or sorry, for, for the, the network boxes, they, they take heavy advantage of this. But again, I'm like I'm telling you, you can't touch, you can't tell the CPU that, yeah. So I don't I don't know what they're doing. No, I'm, it's 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 a compiler director. It's up to the oh sure. It's, changing the order of the it's just changing the order of, of the of the assembly so that the likely paths are, are closer to the top when you go into the conditional. Again, I I don't know whether this is custom hardware or not. Like like yeah. Um, I don't know whether this matters for database systems. Not every system actually uses it. Postgres does, ClickHouse does, and a few others do. Um, yes? Were, are there, were there ever any architectures where you could like, give a hint to the branch prediction? Yeah. The, uh, there used to be an opcode that you could, you could tell the CPU, but that was like 2005 and earlier. Intel supported it back in the day, but not now. Yeah, because people just like are stupid with it too. <laughs> also, databases are too volatile for you to actually take advantage. Of the CPU or the CPU is well designed to know that that secret sauce that I was talking about. That's that's been designed for 20, 30 years. It's really good at figuring out which branch you should take, which branch you should not take. So when you do this, you kind of mess with that. But the, 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 let's look at a case where like it, like even if you had it, it wouldn't help, right? So let's say we have a typical query here. Select star from table where key is greater than low value and key and less than high value. So this is how you probably would write this code. Again, I, I don't like to show code in slides, but this is simple enough. I think you guys can get it. Um, this is how you'd write this code you know, in bus tub or a basic implementation, right? You have a for loop that iterates over two, every tuple in the table. You go grab the key. Then you have the if clause, if key greater than low and key less than high. Then you copy it in the output buffer. Right? Then you iterate whatever the, the buffer offset by one, right? So what's the, what's the problem for the CPU in this code? The if clause, right? Yeah. 
So you can rewrite this uh, to not do any branching. Right? The if clause is going to find a branch, and the CPU is going to try to predict, am I going to go down this path or not? So you can write it like this, as a branchless version, where the very first thing you do as you scan the, scan the, the, the table is you immediately copy the tuple in the output buffer. Right? You don't check to see whether you're, it's going to satisfy the, the conditional, the clause. Then you have this, uh, this clause here where you then check the, the low and the high, but these are ternary operations where it's going to return 1 or 0. You add the bits together, and then that tells you whether the delta is 0 or 1. And then if that, in that case, uh, if, it's, if it's 0, then you would loop back around and just overwrite the last thing you copied. And again, we said all our columns are fixed, fixed, fixed length. So it's not, I, I don't have to worry about, uh, you know, am I going to overflow the buffer or underflow it based on you know, one tuple to the next. I just take the bits, plop it down, and I overwrite the previous one. Now I'm missing a little piece at the end where it says, OK, if I jump out of the, when I come out of the for loop, is the last thing, was the last delta 0, 1, and make sure I don't include that as, as the output, right? So this seems bizarre, right? As humans, we were like, this seems super wasteful. You're copying every single time. It's, surely that's more expensive than the, than the if clause. Right? But it's not, because the CPU knows how to, you know, this is just deterministic straight line code. It can rip through that way, way faster than, than the branch prince prediction. Yes? Is there any advantage to using ternaries instead of just uh, like implicitly dealing with the return? So it's, it's question is, oh, is there any advantage of using ternaries versus like, I mean, the compiler might just convert it into to ones and zeros anyway, if you use booleans. Uh, what? Like, like, just remove everything but key greater than low. Oh, if, what, what if I, if, zero is the same way, right? If I did key greater than and greater than low and key less than high, one or zero, so yeah, just, just delta equals key. Just that. Yeah, you, you yeah, could. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, you could. The compiler. Could, this part I'm not worried about. The compiler. Okay. Compiler can fix that. Okay, I was right. wondering if there's a reason. No, that's the thing I again I'm trying to iterate is like you're always copying. That matters. Right. So the. Again, you think this would be, this'd be terrible because the CPU is blindly copying, but it, it actually helps. So this is, a, uh, this is from the VectorWise people, but this is a, a few years later, in, I think uh, 2013 or 2012. Um, and this is showing you, uh, for the two different approaches I showed, like here's the performance you, different you get as you vary the selectivity of that, of that where clause. So if, if no tuples are matching uh, on, the, on this side here, up to roughly about you know, 5% selectivity, right? The, the, the branching case is actually faster because the CPU is going to say, oh, not going to match, not going to match over and over again, right? And the, the avoiding that extra copy cost every single time is way faster. The red line is essentially flat because you're just doing the same work every single time no matter whether the tuple is going to satisfy the predicate or not. But then you see this, this nice little this arch here uh, where you know, the height, sorry, the, the, the top is very, roughly around 50%. And at this point, it's a flip of the coin every single time. The CPU is predicting, just getting it wrong over and over again. Uh, and then, as you, again, it becomes more selective. The CPU can, can figure it out better. So I, I had students reproduce this graph. I don't have it uh, in the slides. Uh, basically, six years ago, five, five or six years ago, and we basically saw the same thing on, on newer CPUs. Right? So again, the the... This is just showing you, again, what seems like a bizarre thing or wasteful thing for humans to do is actually going to be better for the CPU. In the case here, we're, we're counting CPU cycles per tuple, right? It's not, not exactly runtime. All right, so in terms of how to produce instructions, uh, and again, we'll talk more about this throughout the semester, but the idea here is that we want to specialize our, our, our database system, data system's code, so that when we operate on data, we know exactly the, the data type, the size, and then whatever it is, the operation that we want to do on it. And so we don't have to have these giant switch statements that says, if my data type is in 32 versus in 64 or float, whatever, then you know, here's my instructions to do addition or subtraction, whatever it is. Likewise, I don't want to have to traverse the expression tree uh, when I have my where clause predicates to say, you know, is it greater than or less than, and again, which is usually implicate, implemented as, as giant switch statements. So we want to avoid all of that as much as possible and just have exactly the code we want to, to run our, during our query. Because again, now there's no conditionals, there's no branching. This, we're just giving the CPU, we're just feeding it. Here, here's the exact instructions we, we want you to execute over and over again. So an example of, of doing this wrong, or not wrong, but like 
well, wrong in the context of like the worst way to do it for a modern CPU is you can look at Postgres numeric type. Uh, and so you, it's this function to add two numerics together. And so what do we see? We see a bunch of these if clauses to check to see whether it's a positive number or a negative number, whether it's not a number. And then we have this giant switch statement here to have to deal with all the different variations of, of how to do the addition. And again, this is just adding two numerics together. If I have a billion numbers in my column, I'm trying to add it to another billion numbers, then I'm going to execute the instructions over and over again. This, this can be terrible for on a modern CPU. Is it the same for like the match thing in Rust? Or? The question is, is it the same thing for the match thing in Rust? It's not, that's a compiler time thing, right? Is it? Uh, it's, it, it, gets, like, it gets compiled away from yourself. Oh, it does? Okay. Yeah. So I think switch is better than it does, right? Yeah, it's a jump table. Right? It doesn't matter. It's a jump table, yes. But it's jumps. Jumps. Yeah. That's bad. Jumps are bad. Function calls are bad, jumps are bad, right? But we do need to verify, get the types. So if we don't have branches, I'm not sure how you would rewrite this. As this question is, like, you do need to get the types. Yeah. Yes. So how, if, if, if we had to rewrite this without the switch, I'm not even sure how you would do that. Because you need to do the stuff that they want to compare, right? Well, I, I, ignore numerics, right? Because that, we can go offline how, how to optimize this. But just think of, like, if you had a number plus a number, so like, is it an in 32 is it in 64 And you would have to have different right. branches for all those. Right. But because we're, it's SQL, it's a declarative language, we have our catalog. We know exactly the data types. So we, if, we're, if, we're, if we set up the system in such a way that we know exactly the instructions we want to execute, then we, we, can, we can design you can do that with, yeah, design things ahead of time and be way faster. And whether or not we pre-compile the primitives we want to use to, to operate on different data types, or we just in time compile it, we'll cover that later. All right, so now with all that in mind, now, now we want to talk about what, how we want to design the, 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 the execution and processing model to then lead us to the path of enlightenment or whatever you want to call it, of being able to, to achieve those, those three goals, right? So this would be a somewhat of a, a review from the intro class, but I'm going to go in a bit more detail of how the system is actually going to operate uh, beyond what we covered in the intro class, and then that'll segue into discussing the... the you know, the, the direction of, of how we move data between different operators. So the processing model is going to find essentially how the data system is going to execute a query plan, meaning how it's going to tell what operator to run next, and then where that operator is going to send data to, 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 data to right? Or where that operator is going to get data from, so to speak. And there'll be different trade-offs we have for OTP systems and OLAP systems or OLAP workloads and OLAP workloads. And we'll see how, in the case of the Volcano model, the Iterator model, that's the default choice for most database systems like row stores, and that's great for OLTP, but it's not going to be so great for, for OLAP. So every processing model is going to be defined in terms of, of, of the execution paths. And the two types of execution paths we can have are the control flow and the data flow. So the control flow is going to be how the data system is going to tell an operator or operator instance, OK, now it's your turn to run. And then the Data flow is going to specify for each operator instance where does it send data to and where is it data, where is it getting data from. And so the output of these operators can either be whole tuples in the case of the row store or a subset of columns. And in our case, what we are going to care about in the OLAP world is going to be NSMs. And what we can ignore latent materialization, you know, whether or not we're, it's the, all the columns or a subset of columns, we can worry about that later. So the three processing models that we're going to care about are iterators, materialization, or the columnar one from, from the, the X100 paper. And then that'll lead to, again, the vectorized model. And the spoiler is going to be this last one here as well. Every OLAP system, uh, except for a few exceptions, right, are going to implement this approach because it's sort of the best of both worlds of the iterator model and the materialization model. All right, so the iterator model, or also called the volcano model, or the pipeline model, uh, I'll often probably just say volcano model. Um, is, is, again, is basically how every database system up until the, the MoneyDB paper or the VectorWise paper you guys read, this is how pretty much, pretty much everyone implemented uh, their query processing model. So every, in, your, in, your, in, your, in your source code, in your system, you're going to have all your operator uh, implementations, and each one's going to provide this next function. And so what's going to happen is every time you, you, you want to get a tuple from an operator on the control flow path, you would then invoke the next function on that operator who then we're responsible for producing either a single tuple 
or some kind of end of file or null marker to say, I have no more tuples, never ask me you know, for more data. Right? And you can sort of think of like within that operator, it's, it's just going to be a for loop that's going to retrieve all the tuples that it needs from, a, uh, from its child operators. And then depending on whether it's a pipeline breaker or not, it either gets all the data from its children, if it is a pipeline breaker, or it can just get one tuple. Uh, and as long as it satisfies whatever that operator wants to do on it and can produce the output, then it's done. So you sort of think of like, again, the, the way would, you would actually implement this is you'd have these open and close functions on the operator. It's like constructors or deconstructors for your operators. And then so you, so you open it, call next, 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 next on it, get all the output you want, and then when it says I'm done, then you call close, and that cleans everything up. So this is a, a high-level example. So we want to join R and S, and we have a, a, on, a join conditional on, on RID, SID, and then we have an additional where clause uh, where S value is greater than 100. So you can sort of think of like each of these operator can have these, uh, these implementations. As I said, they're going to be basically just for loops that, that's going to make calls to its children uh, operators to pull data up or move data up uh, and then produce output if, when it's available. So you can think of these, these box, blocks of code here. These are all the next functions. So th we're going to start off. The, the database system says, OK, I want to run this query. Assume we're going from, from, from the top to the bottom. We would call it next on the, the first, first operator here. And then immediately inside that, we have this for loop that says, call next on my child operator. So that would be the blocking call. So the, the, the control flow would move from the, the top operator to the second operator here for, to do the hash join, where immediately inside that one, we have a for loop that says, call next on its child, because it wants to build the hash table. So then the control flow takes us down here. And now we're just iterating over the, the, the table R. And we're calling emit, which is the return control, or sending one tuple back up to the calling function. And so there's some state inside of each of these operators that keeps track of, like, the last time you called next, here's where I was, here's, my, here's where my cursor was when I was scanning the table. So we're going to keep calling next on uh, the, the bottom operator here until we get all the data, until we can end a file. And at this point here, we know our hash table has all the tuples we, would, we, we need. So we, again, we won't have any false negatives. So then I go down to the next, next block in my operator. And I'm calling next on my, my child, on the right child. So I come down this side, same thing, scan over to R, pass it up to the next operator. It applies the predicate. If that gets, uh, that gets uh, satisfied the predicate, then it sends it up to do the probe. Right? So you sort of daisy chain these things up, up like this. So again, going back to, to this notion of pipelines, you sort of think of like this block three and the first half of block two, that's pipeline, pipeline one. And then this four, five, four, the bottom two, and one. That's pipeline two. So I execute pipeline one, uh, uh, ideally. And then, sorry, in this case here, you're, you, there, there's pipeline boundaries, but you're not doing any optimizations, right? Because implicitly, you, the code is set up so you know that you can't run the second pipeline until the first part's actually done, right? So again, this will differ when we see the operator fusion technique or the push-based approach, because they're actually going to try to combine these within a single operator instance. Uh, and not have these you know, calling next within, within themselves. So as I said, this is pretty much what everybody implements uh, in, in sort of the first database systems that they build, or row store systems. Bus tub is, is based on this. Yes? In that previous slide, wouldn't you want to build a hash table on the table that has the, the filter? Mm -hmm. His question is, should, shouldn't you want to build a hash table on the one that has the filter? <laughs> you don't know, right? First of all, this is a logical diagram. It's a PowerPoint slide, right? <laughs> I don't have stats here. But, what if this thing is like one tuple? Right. So anyway, um, so the all right, so the iterative models approach everybody implements. Uh, Apple control is really easy for this because if you if you know you've gotten enough tuples as the output, you just ca stop calling next and you finish. Right. The downside though is that the we're, we're basically mixing control flow with data flow. Again, just going back quickly, like there's no way to sort of say, okay, I don't want to execute this thing anymore uh, because I've got enough data, um, or stop executing certain parts because you know I'm calling next to get to get things up, right? It's, everything's like if if I call next on this, implicitly going to call next on its children, right? Because that's sort of how the the, the query plan has been set up, or the, how, that's how the iterator model uh, allows you to control the behavior of the execution. It's going to allow us to do pipelining. Uh, again, the idea here is that we want to have, 
for every single tuple that we get from a, um, you know, from, from a child operator, we want to do as much processing as we can up the query plan until we get, uh, until we get a pipeline breaker or produce the final output. And the idea is there we, we can maintain or we can achieve good cache locality because we bring a tuple in and we do as much work as we can while it's in memory before we go off to, to the next tuple. Right, until we hit a pipeline breaker, which again, we, we, we know we can't have an operator complete until we f get all its children to emit their tuples. So on the build side of joins, we have this problem. Subqueries, depending w whether they get rewritten or not, and to joins, you have this problem. And order by or sorting obviously has this problem. Some aggregations, min and max, right? Same thing. So the, the downside, though, is that you're basically calling next for every single tuple. If I have a billion tuples, I'm calling a billion function calls to just call next times the number of whatever operators that I have or number of tuples that are being sent up. Right? So an alternative approach that was, that was pioneered by MoneyDB in the late 90s, early 2000s, was to do what is called the materialization model, where every operator produces all its output all at once. Anytime you call next on it, it generates all the output and then hands that off to, to the next operator. So you, once you call next, you never go back and ask for more data for it. Right? Right, the idea is again, it's called materialization model because you materialize each operator is materializing all, all its output as in, in a single result. And again, the output could either be a single row, a single column, or the entire table. Yes. Pipeline breakers are basically materialization, right? Because you end up materializing the entire result. His, his statement is pipeline breakers are essentially the same thing as, as pipeline breakers because you materialize the, the entire result. Not necessarily, right? Because I could call next. On a, uh, on, a, on a pipeline breaker, um, well, you're like, yeah, to, to your point, yes. Like, I could produce all the output, and then something, something's going to feed into that, that pipeline breaker result. I could just get a single tuple. I wouldn't pass, because it's still like one tuple at a time called next. I wouldn't have this giant output get shoved all the way up, all of a sudden switch to the processing model. Right. But to your point, like the pipeline breaker, it has, like, you're materializing all the results at that point there. Yes. Right. Yes. But, it, but in the case of materialization model, every next call moves the entire result always up. Okay. So it's not as simple as saying that materialization model is just saying every operator has, has a pipeline breaker. It's not as simple as just saying that. Uh, his statement is it, it's not as simple as saying in the materialization model that every, every operator is a pipeline breaker. That's okay. Yeah, I, I think that's fine. Yeah, yeah it makes sense. Yeah. I, you wouldn't describe it that way, though, but like, it makes sense, yes. Um, all right, so let's see how to go back to our original query we had before. And again, now in our, in our, in our operator implementations, now we see that, like, again, we have this output buffer, and we just keep adding tuples, and then there's a return clause where, again, all the output goes, you know, goes up to the next guy. So just like before, we start at the top. We call uh, the, the, the root operator calls child.output, calls this guy, who then has to build a hash table, calls down to the, the scan on R, and then we, we populate the entire output buffer, and then shove, shove the result up. And again, if I have a billion tuples, even if I want one column for, for a billion tuples, I'm gonna have, my output buffer is going to be a billion tuples in, in, in this approach. And then, again, same thing, I go down the other, sorry, all the tuples, I go down the other side, uh, I call the, the, the filter, which then calls the scan on, on, the, on S, and the same thing, the, the data gets moved up like this. Right. So an obvious optimization here is that if, for this side of the query plan, I'm scanning S and then you know, materialize the result and then immediately hand it off to a filter operator who then basically you know, throws some stuff away. So an obvious optimization is to inline these two right, or fuse them together so that as you scan S, then you evaluate the predicate. And then if that evaluates true, then you include in the output. Right? Again, you could, you could do that branchless technique we saw before. Right? I'm showing with the if clause, but you, you could do that thing, that, that optimization we just saw. So this is great for OLTP, uh, because in those, that world, the queries are accessing a single tuple. So even though you're materializing the entire result, it's going to be one tuple. And then it's just one less next call to, you know, to go get, you know, before you get the end of file. Like it's every, you know, you've got everything you would ever need for an operator, and you can move on. You have to do that inline and make sure you're not passing up more data than you actually need, uh, but it, it works great. And then when we built HStore that became VoltDB, this is, we, we use this approach. Um, 
But I would argue, and the, the paper you read argues that this is bad for OLAP because you, you, know, you may be coalescing or printing out a bunch of data in higher parts of the query plan, but you're moving these large, large columns from one operator to the, to the next. So it's great that, again, you have fewer next calls, but you're moving da more data than you potentially actually need. So the vectorization model is, a, is an obvious optimization, or it's obvious now, but at the time it wasn't. Um, that's, that's sort of getting the best of both worlds, right? That you're still going to have this next call that's going to move tuples up, or move tuples from one operator to the next, but instead of moving a single tuple as you would in the iterator model, you're going to move a batch of tuples, or vector tuples. Um, again, the naming's bad because you say, like, oh, it's the vectorized, vectorized pre query processing. Uh, you know, now with, with vector databases that people may think you're doing, like sending embeddings or something like that, which we're not doing. So we're going to embed a batch of tuples instead of a single tuple. The, and then we're going to have our operator, like the, the loops themselves, be designed to operate on these, on these batches of tuples at a time. Right? Um, and the size of the, the batch can vary depending on what the data looks like, what the query actually wants to do, or what the harbor looks like. I think in the paper they were talking about 1024. Um, that's usually roughly what I think most systems are using. Um, some systems might, might be a bit smaller. Um, we'll, we'll see examples of that later on. And again, the, the batch is either going to be going to be one column or, or a subset of columns based on whether, whether or not you're doing late, material, late materialization or not, or you've already done projections on it, right? So if we go back to our query one more time, all right, now within our, uh, in our implementations, we still have an output buffer, and we're going to add things to it, but now we're going to have this conditional clause that says when we've accumulated enough tuples for the size that is expected for our vectors, then we can emit it up or send it up. All right, so same thing, we called it out before, fill up our... Uh, our a vector output buffer, and then we use that to send it up. All right, we send a tuple batch, and then same thing down on, on the other side here. Yes? Implicitly, if you like, run out of things to iterate over, you'll just send up whatever remains in the full batch. Yeah, the question is, or statement is, uh, if, uh, if I'm at the end of R, and if the size of the output buffer is less than N, but if I'm done, then yeah, you send it up. Yeah, so you would have a little thing outside the full cost. Yes. And then you just We'll talk about this in a second, but like you basically keep track of like, okay, here's the rows that are actually active. And whether you use that bitmaps or offsets, we'll, we'll see that in a second. Right? Okay. So, as I said, this is the, this is, this, the vectorized pre-processing model is what every modern OLAP system is going to use today. Um, and it's because it's going to greatly reduce the number of next calls we have to have per operator and it's going to allow a out of order CPU to be able to efficiently execute our operators over a batch of tuples, assuming we've, we've designed our system in a way to, to, to operate on, on these vectors. Right? So, again, in uh, the, the, the authors of the paper talked about they could have called it the array processing model, but that's essentially what it comes down to do, you're, what you're doing. These batches of tuples are just arrays, and then within each operator, as you get the input, uh, input vector from your child, now you have a for loop of going over arrays. And that's the ideal scenario for out-of-order out of superscalar CPUs. They love processing arrays, right? So you can do all of the, the uh, specs execution check tricks we talked about before. You can do vectorization with SIMD, which we'll see more about next week. Right? All these things we, we can take advantage of because we know we're doing the same operation over and over again within a tight kernel on the, the data that's going to be the same, same type, same length, uh, for the most part, ignoring strings. But like, we, we can crush that. Yes? I'm trying to understand the distinction between materialized and vectorized, because in both cases it seems like you are sending a bunch of data at the same time. Here it's in the form of array, sure, but it's still, like, what's... Like, like uh, so the statement is, his question is, what's actually, what's the fundamental difference between materialization model and, and vectorized, vectorized? That, like, the size of the output isn't everything, so that we can... Uh, we can take advantage of other pipelining. We can take advantage of pipelining for our vectors because we we don't we, we can take we're taking batches of tuples in sort of digestible bites, right? It's having this whole thing gotta process it process it for the entire operator, then move on to the next operator. I can have this like pipelined execution where I'm just taking some vector tuples and ripping through it, and only going back to the next vector either when I reach my final output or I, all the tuples got thrown away or something like that. It's like in material, like you say you can still use limit to say I don't 
you want so many tuples, but here you're just saying one zero two four instead of. His statement is in the case of materialization model, you can use limit to say I only want certain tuples, but like oftentimes like that limit clause is applied near the root of the query plan. Like give me the top ten, uh, you know, t top ten accounts, you know, based on some number, some some column. I got to sort them before I can get to the top ten, right? So that means that if even though I'm going to throw away most of the data in the materialization model, I, I got to pump a lot of that data up. Now you say, okay, in vectorization model, you still have to do that, right? But like the implementations of the operators themselves can deal with these, the, you know, these chunks of data that can fit in your, your you know, L3, L2 caches. You're not dealing with this, this giant blob of data that's going to be, that's going to have a bunch of cache, cache misses. Yeah. Yes. Uh, can you clarify what the difference between control flow and data flow is? And like, what the different options you have for both control flow and data flow? Yeah, so his question is, what's the difference between control flow and, and data flow? So, oops, sorry. So control flow, again, is how the, 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 the part of the data system that says, okay, time to execute this query, how it tells an operator to say, start running. And in the case of, uh, in all the purchases I'm showing, showing here, we're, we're using top to bottom, so we're calling next. And that's the control flow. So, so we call next on the top operator. It then calls next on this child operator. That's the control flow. And then the data flow is where the data is moving back, right? We'll see that we'll see a distinction, a better distinction when we talk about push versus pull. In the push versus pull, the where the execution of the of one operator versus the next operator is not embedded in, in the execution of another operator. That we can then say, okay, now it's time to execute this pipeline. And that's, there's an outside system that makes that call. It did, and then that operator then does not, or Python does not call the another pipeline. There's something else set that's centralized, centralized that's managing all that. Whereas, like, so, go ahead, yes. So the two different options for control flow are push and pull. Uh, yeah, yes, but like, you wouldn't say it that way, right? That you'd have a different approach to doing control flow if you're doing a push versus approach versus a pull versus approach. Okay. Yeah, we'll come to that in a second. And what are the different options for data flow? Is it tuple versus the whole thing? Yeah, so, so, so his point is, the question is, what's the different options for data flow? You can think of the pricing processing model as defining that, that as well. The push versus pull is part of that as well. It's, 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 but like, yeah, do you use the data flow? Is it a single tuple, all the tuples, or a batch of tuples? Um, so another great thing to also too, because again we have these these tight kernels and it's processing these batches of tuples, all the you know all the instructions that we're going to execute for that, what's inside that kernel, for every single iteration is going to be in our you know instruction cache, all right, and that, that's going to be super fast. Um, we'll have very few data dependency control dependencies because we don't need to we don't need to see the output of a of another tuple within our batch to determine what the next thing we need to execute, right? It's not always entirely true, but like you can, you know, you you in most cases that this will be the case, right? Whether or not a predicate, a tuple has a predicate, doesn't matter whether the last tuple satisfied that predicate or not. Again, not always true. Window functions complicate things, but we can ignore that. Again, we'll, and we'll see this next week. The great thing about having these tight for loops is over arrays. That's what the CPU wants. That was, that was what, that's what the compiler wants to be able to vectorize this using SIMD. We'll see how to explicitly do that, do that uh, in next week. So this is from the uh, from Peter Bonsa's slide from the when he won the the Test of Time Award for this paper. But in the discussion about why <laughs> why they saw the vectorized model be so much faster than the iterator, the volcano model, or the um, the materialization model that was used in MoDB, right? In case the, the volcano model. The interpretation overhead we'll cover later on. That's pre-cog priorities. But now you don't have this, you know, per tuple navigation of again calling next, next, next or every single tuple. It's now, you know, if I'm if I'm bat, you know, 10, 24 size batches, I'm just reducing the number of calls by 10, 24. It's it's pretty significant. In the case of MoDB, we'll see this more later on. But the query plans will be much more simpler because it's just like as it was in the iterator model, except now you're passing batches of tuples, whereas in MoDB. They were sort of keeping track of in, implicitly. Here's all the columns I'm passing around, uh, and it, it was it was way more complicated. 
And then all the optimizations you get from the compiler or SIMD, that's just, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's in addition to all the other things just by designing the system itself uh, to, to pass around batches of data, things run faster. But then, oh, by the way, the compiler can also rip through it much, much better as well. Okay, so leading to what, his question about push versus pull, but in all the examples that it showed, there was this next function, uh, you know, whether it was vectorized, materialized, or, um, or iterator, there's this next call that I'm making on, on per operator, right? And I'm always starting at the top, calling the root, and going down and, and, and bringing things up. And again, this is how most systems are going to implement the execution engine, but it, it isn't the, old, the only way. And this gets into the distinction of, of, of top to bottom, the pull-based approach to the bottom and top. So again, the top to bottom is what I just showed. If you want to start executing the query, you call next on the root, and then that will then call next on its children and propagates down. So they're pulling data from the bottom of the query plan up to the top, to the root, and that produces the final output. Right? And the, you're always going to be calling you know, next to get the next tuple, unless it's a pipeline breaker, because that'll stage data in a, in a sort of intermediate result that you then go access. But you're always passing tuples by calling, passing data by calling next. And that, that's going to be a function call. That's a jump instruction. And again, that's bad for a superscalar CPU. Alternative approach is the push-based model, where you start with the leaf nodes in the query plan. And you have some outside controller or scheduler you know, initiate the invocation of that, of that, of that operator, that pipeline. And then it's going to take the data that it, that it generates and push it to the next operator. Yes? How are we doing the queues? How does that We'll get that in a second. Yes. So this is rare. Uh, this is, it's probably more common now. But again, when, when this paper, the paper you guys read in 2005, this approach didn't, didn't exist. This shows up in a paper that you're assigned to read in a few weeks from the Germans uh, in the system called Hyper. The dude's insane. It's a one-person author and paper. He invented, uh, or didn't invent, but he showed how to do query, just-in-time query compilation with the LLVM in Hyper. Plus, also, he invents the push-based model in, in the paper as well. And he's got three kids. He teaches two classes a, a semester. Uh, and he doesn't do drugs. It's insane, right? <laughs> he's the exact opposite. He's, he's very straight-laced. Anyway, um, all right, so let, let's see how we do this. Okay, so here's our same query we had before. And now, here's our two pipelines. But now, instead of having a bunch of different operators that we're going to have that implement the, the individual, or the blocks of code that I implement the individual operators, now we're just going to have two for loops, right? And so on, for the first, first pipeline, we're still going to scan R and then populate the hash table. But in the second pipeline, we're going to scan S. And now you can see where that, what we're going to try to do is ride every single tuple all the way up to the top of the query plan before we go back and look at the next tuple or the, or the batch of tuples. Even though I'm showing this operator in a single tuple, you could do this on a batch as well, right? So for every tuple in S, then you evaluate the predicate. If that matches, then you probe the hash table. Then if that matches, then you put it as, as, as the output. Yes? How are we going to get this accused by an election? This is, this is fusion right here. So how, how did that even end up happening? Like, I mean, how did that happen? In the sense that you want your abstraction to be an operator. So like, if you, would you literally hard code every single combination of operators that could possibly come in? OK. So his, his question is basically, how do you do this? Uh, would you have to hard code every single possible combination of query plans right. to execute this? No. Right. So how would you have that? That's a very Two weeks. Okay. The answer is going to be you, either, you just in time compile this. You literally generate the code on the fly for the query plan that fuses this together, then compile it with the LLVM or GCC or Clang. Then run that. Okay. That's approach number one. Approach number two is that you recognize, I only have so many data types in my database system, and there's only so many things I could do to them. So each of these are just functions, uh -huh. right? And I just put them in an array, uh -huh. and I execute one, you know, one by one. That's what vectorwise does. That's code specialization. Give me two weeks. Okay. okay. But is that, yeah. right? That's yeah. Your mind looks blown. That fact you can compile this on the fly? Yeah, that's what they do. <laughs> they're, they're German, right? Um, <laughs> the Swiss are good, too. The Swiss are good, too. Um, so, all right, uh, and this, this is hard, right? Like, like I don't get too ahead. It's even crazier than that. The new version, he, like, in this version, they will, uh, 
in hyper, they would generate the LLM IR, then compile that. Single store will generate C code, then compile that, at least the ver version. In the latest version, the new system they're building called Umbra, he doesn't generate IR, he generates literally x86 assembly. <laughs> through like C++ macros, then he runs that through the assembler. Then while in the background he's running the LLVM, compiles the assembled code into a shared object, and when, that, when that's done, he then links it in. Yeah, German, yes. So when you're talking about like compiling like, each of those, like, the, like you have a fixed number of functions, you compile, compile them from all an array, are these like function pointers, and like, you, like when you like, want to fuse things together, like I need this fun, like, function A, function B, and then you like rearrange everything in your array so that you can execute it in that order? Yes, yeah, so the question is, the way I would do this, if, if there are a bunch of function pointers, would be a bunch of arrays where I'm putting in, I need to do this, then followed by this, followed by this, and then would you just call, invoke this function pointer as you go along? Yes. And that, that would suck if you're doing it on a, tu on a per tuple basis. But if you do batches of tuples in the vectorized model, then that amortizes the jump call. And then now you don't have giant switch statements of like, what branch should I go down? Yes? Why can't we achieve it in a pool-based model? So, so why can't you do this in a pool-based model? Uh, good question. I mean, I mean talk about the fusion part. I mean, at a high level, is this the same? Like, at, at a high level, is it the same? More or less, yes, right? Because this, this, like, you couldn't say, okay, I do the scan, then you know, the, the, the next call does this, the next call does that, right? But again, the, in the pool-based approach, the way the software is actually engineered and designed is the abstraction is through these next functions. So, if could you take a pool-based model and then co-gen it to turn it into this? Yes. You said this is the main reason push is better than pull, or are there other factors that are not the, So the control flow matters too, right? Uh, so like when I want to actually get execute this, there's some outside scatter says, okay, run this when once this populates the hash table, right? And then you can then also specify where the output's going and say some output buffer, and then that this thing's going to know about. When that's done, then I schedule the next one and it produces the output, right? Oh, so you can have complete control over everything. Yes. <coughs> Yes. Yeah, and also like it's kind of like a DAG, right? Like you can like, since we're pushing the data, you're like trying to like, how, do you, how does the scheduler specify like where to emit? Like do you need to emit like, let's say R, like is it like feeds into two different distinct pipelines, so it needs to send to two different places. So the question is how does, if R needs to go to, to two different places, how do we handle that? Yeah, or like does the scheduler tell us, or does like, is the, do you just get a tree and then the... Like, so the, the way it would be, the scheduler, so something before we actually start executing would, would specify where this output's going to go. So if it's got to go to two locations, you tell it, by the way, send it to two locations. And it can either be um, like the, the, the operator itself, I mean, or the execution could be responsible for sending it exactly to the location it needs to go to, or you could have like a shuffle service, which we'll cover later, that says like, okay, well, I don't know exactly where to, how to get it to where it needs to go, but if I know I send it to this other service, it'll then distribute it for me. Okay, I don't want to get too far ahead of, of like, like yeah, yeah. It's, 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 stuff is really, really cool. But not everyone does exactly the, the again, as I said before, the co-genning this on the fly is going to be, is be hard to maintain. Yeah. The Germans can do it, few others can. And then, it also makes it easy? No. 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 <laughs> no. Okay, the, the, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll leave a little mystery, right? We'll, we'll see why. And I'll be honest, we implemented this here, right? We implemented it twice. Uh -huh. And the, the, even the second time was meant to be easier for other people to use. And it was still like, impossible. you know, it's not impossible, it's just harder. All right, so again, this is just reiterating what I've already said. Top to bottom, we, can, we have complete control. We, we control the output via limit. Um, and basically the child operator has a block until the, the child, so the parent operator blocks until the child comes back with the results. Um, and the, Again, the next functions aren't cheap because they're essentially going to be virtual function lookups in C++. Because I'm stitching together this query plan with pointers, and then at runtime, I have to do the, the, the virtual function lookup to say, okay, what is the actual location of the function I want to execute for that, for that given, um, for that given uh, child operator. And then, of course, these next call is going to be jumps, and that's going to suck for us in the CPU. In the case of the bottom to top, 
again, if you can have tighter control of the caches and registers and the pipelines. In the case of the hyperpaper, again, not only are going to keep data in, in, in L1 cache, they're going to keep it in CPU registers. Can't go faster than that, right? Uh, so the only challenge is that in some cases, you may not have complete control of limiting the size of an output buffer um, because you need to, you're, you're, you have no way to sort of, you know, in the case of like the next call, if I got enough data at the top of my query plan, then I just call, I don't call next anymore. But in the case of the, the push based model, even though I may be still sending entire batches instead of, instead of all the output, I may get more data in a batch than I actually want. Yes? So the full benefit only comes if you're using limit. Like, otherwise, there's, I don't think there's any other operator that like limits like, the data that it wants, right? Uh, so statement, statement is, the, the only benefit you get from, uh, from having Apple control at the top is through limits. Uh, I think that's true, yes. Meaning window functions. Superficially, I say yes, but I might be wrong. In the case of push, it's actually tricky to do also start merge because um, you need two iterators at the same time, and you have to keep extra state. I mean, it's, not, it's not impossible. You can do it. It's a, it's a little bit more tricky because right? it's not that like you know nested for loops ripping through uh, a single tuple within a batch. Yes. The question is, if we're doing push-based, is, is there still a distinction between uh, two at a time, entire output versus the entire uh, versus the vector? Absolutely, yes. So my example here, I'm, I'm iterating over, over a single tuple, right? And I call eval predicate, right? And again, assuming that they're, they're function pointers, I'm jumping every single time to you know eval predicate for one tuple. What you could do is like you could pass a, pass a batch of tuples, call this this vectorized version of eval predicate. And then it gets a batch of processes of those, right? So they're compatible. Okay, I don't think we're going to get through parallel execution, but, but let's finish up with um, we'll, we'll cover that next class. But we'll, let's finish up with, uh, with with how to represent filter data. So in the um, in the iterator model, because we're operating or every operator is going to process one tuple at a time. If something doesn't match, like a predicate, something's not meant to be produced as an output, then we don't send it up to the parent operator, right? We either call next and get the next 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 tuple from our child or whatever we're, we're, you know the local thing we're processing, or we return back end of file, meaning we have no more. So that means that at no point in the query plan will we send up data that we know has been disqualified or is thrown out uh, because we, we we wouldn't have emitted it up. Right? But in the vectorized model, you can't do that because you're operating on batches of tuples. So you may have, based on what your, your predicate is or whatever the operation you're trying to do, you may end up f filtering out or, th or throwing away some tuples inside the vector while other tuples still need to, be, need to be passed up. So now the question is, how do we handle that? So basically, we have a vector that's going to have things, half the data is we want to keep, half the data we know we, we want to throw away. Oops, sorry. So let's say we have a, a query like this, where the where clause is where column zero is null and column one or column one is like, uh, and then being a wild card. So say this is my data, I have column zero, column one. And so if I now do the filtering on this data, say this is coming in as, as a batch, this is the output I really want, right? Because this, this this, logically, this is the correct result. But how did I get there? Because I don't want to have to copy everything out and then put it back into another buffer, that's going to be slow. And so I need a way to represent uh, logically that these are the tuples that have been filtered out, even though physically I may be still be passing on dead tuples or tuples that I, that I don't, they don't need. So there's two approaches to do this. The first is use what's called a selection vector, uh, sometimes also called a position list. Um, and the idea here, it's just going to be a, a, a densely packed array of the offsets of the tuples within my you know, vector that I'm passing from one operator to the next that are still valid, are still alive, are still active. Right? So again, going back to my example here, uh, my selecting vector would just be a list of offsets, one, three, four, because right? they correspond to the tuples that satisfy the predicate. So now this is what gets passed on from, as the output of next 
or if I'm pushing it along in the push base model, this is what the next operator is going to process on. So now when I start doing whatever it is, you know, I get this batch of data, I have this, this selection vector, I have to then account for some of the data may have been discarded and some of the data, you know, some of the data is still active. Yes? This must affect SIMD somewhere, right? Because why do this? This question is, this must affect SIMD, right? Or, the question is, why do this? Right? right? Because it's, and the answer is going to be yes and for SIMD and for other operations. It, it's just, it's actually going to be faster for us just to pass along garbage, okay. right? And then if the case of like, if, if the selection vector goes zero, then I know everything's discarded and I, and I just throw the entire thing away, sure. right, and jump out. But it's going to be faster for us to, to not have to play after every single step saying like, in, it's easier to visualize this in like the, 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 the fusion model or the fusion approach. Like, it's, e it's easier from going from one sort of line to the next line within my, my, my nested for loop to not have to go resize, you know, allocate memory resize and stuff like that, right? The alternative approach is to do bitmaps. And this is just going to be a, a bitmap that corresponds, has the same length as the number of, of, of tuples in my vector that I'm passing along. And it's just a 0, 1 that specifies whether the, the tuple at the given offset is valid or not. And again, as he, as he, as he, as he brought up, this is going to matter. This is make our life easier in SIMD in some cases, because some SIMD instructions in AVX 512 will actually take this as input as a mask. And we'll, you can use it to tell it, hey, don't process the data in these lanes because I don't care. I don't care for the output. So again, we'll 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 see more of this later on. Actually, you know, uh, how, how to design you know SIMD uh, optimized operations or algorithms for for a query plans or database system that can use all these things. Um, the current research literature actually says the top one is the, is the faster way to do this. Um, so the Photon paper from, from Databricks, we'll read later on, says this. Uh, and then our own research paper. Um. Why would this even be relevant if you're doing the fuse thing? Because if, if you're doing a fuse thing, it's just one or whatever, it's a nested layer of all loops because we fused all the pipeline level operators. That, that means that there's a pipeline breaker at the end of it. We don't need to use vectorization data flow if we just uh, are dealing in that abstraction. So your statement is, if we're doing this, yeah. doing this, why do I even need that? Why do I even need to? Because, see, at the end of it, we're just going to have to, it, it's almost like we have, a, we have a pipeline breaker at the end of it, right? No, no, so, so like, li literally think of like, say, say the T2 is being a single tuple, say it's a batch, a vector. Yes. Yeah. I call this eval predicate, right? It's going to then populate either the position list, the selection vector, or the, the output, the, the bitmap, right? If it's the bitmap, I do pop count, tell me how many zeros I have, or how many ones I have. If, it's, if I have at least one one, then I know I want to do this. Uh, if, if you don't do that, then I got to go copy, go iterate over every single tuple within my batch, populate a new output buffer, then feed that into my probe hash table. Right? right? It's just faster to, to do zero copy, operate on the data as it exists, but I'm just updating bits or, or a position list to say which tuples actually matter. And then all these implementations of these operators, which we'll cover later, take as input with the selection vector or the bit mask and know whether or not to, to even consider to put an offset. What if we had S was the batch and there was an outer loop that was actually looping through a bunch of S's? Like, what, like, you see how that could be much better? Yeah, but don't do that. We can do cogen, they can do all of this stuff, they can't do that. Yeah, but, like, but like that's, that's going to be you know, scalar instruction, SISTI. We can vectorize all of this. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so that's what, okay. yeah. That's why this course exists and why people pay you a lot of money to do this stuff, right? It's hard. Um, all right. Yes? Uh, in a full case, suppose, could we possibly like, wait for the entire vector to fill up and then pass it along instead of doing this? Uh, so the statement is, uh, if I, going back to the... Um, so could you do, in a pool-based approach, uh, like just wait for the vector to fill up completely and only then pass it up. Keep pulling from the ones below it. But so, so, but are you pulling a batch of tuples, a vector tuples, or a single tuple? A batch of tuples. So, so it's yeah. So, so the statement is: Can if if I have in my example here, so I have uh, three out of three out of what five, three out of five match. 
So I have two empty slots. Can I just call next below me, get the next vector, then you know, at least find two matches that I then put in this vector here? But that's a more bookkeeping to keep track of like how many sp spaces do I have. Then I still got to maintain the, the, the intermediate result of, of the child thing I, I called before me. It's not worth it. That's just way more indirection, way more branching, way more conditionals. If I just blindly just keep track of here's what doesn't match, this is way faster. Again, as humans, this goes back to the, the branchless you know, conditional I showed before, or this branchless scan. As you're all coming up with examples like, hey, this seems kind of wasteful. You're passing along tuples. Like, you know, what, what if I have 1024, uh, my vector size is 1024, all but one of them are, are thrown away? Well, again, it's just faster to pass along the other 10, 1023 useless tuples then rather than having to do what he's proposing of going, getting intermediate results and filling in the empty space, right? It's not worth it. Just do exactly, if you do the same thing that's very uh, straightforward, and even though you may end up executing more instructions, but you end up using fewer cycles because, again, there's, it's, it's set up in a way that the CPU wants. Yes? The statement is, with the selection vector keep getting shorter and shorter, in, well, it depends on the query, depends on the data, right? But you would, you would typically size it for the exact size of, the, the, of the, the vector you're passing along, so like 1024, and just have a length to say where the offset is, or where, where, where the end actually is, right? And again, these aren't have to be 64-bit IDs. If, you're, if you only have 1024 possible values, you, know, you could store that in 16-bit in 16 16 -bit numbers. So it's not that big. Yes. Can the size of the vectors be adapted? Uh, the the size meaning like the the allocated size or the actual yeah. contents. Well, why? Why? I don't know. Maybe if they're all empty, you know, it's going to be like you can start taking all of them. But it's not. Like, so it's, I think what you're saying is like, could you basically do almost like slab allocation to say like, here's my ten value vector. And here's my 30 value vector, or whatever, like 32 value of 64. And like, as I get full in one vector, then I go use the other one, and therefore things hang around in L3, or sorry, L1 more. But it's not that big. 1024 times 16 bits is not that big. Yeah. Again, what you're proposing is you could do. Is that what the CPU wants, though? No. Because the worst thing we the worst thing we possibly do is call malloc while we're doing any of this. Because who, who are we talking to? We call malloc. The operating system, right? He's an <laughs> he's going to screw us over. So like, we don't want to, like, we pre-allocate everything ahead of time. Yes, there's going to be wasted space, but like, it's better than having, again, this, this uh, it's better than having code to figure out, okay, try to be clever. Simple is better in this case. Because again, it's just ripping through tuples as fast as possible. Okay? All right, we're over time. Uh, we'll cover, uh, we'll cover parallel execution and bidding class on Wednesday, okay? All right, guys. See ya. Get a you know, you know, belt to get the 40 ounce bottle. Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't it no puzzle, I guzzle, cause I'm more man. I'm down in the 40, and my shorty's got four cans. Stacks and six packs on the table. And I'm able to see St. Isles on the label. No shorts with the cross, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw about three in the freezer so I can chill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, you just don't spill it. Cause St. Isles is said, the paint is red. Get down with the guys, it'll run head. Take back the pack of duds. They go get you some same knives and drink it to the suds. Billy D is the chili cheese, sit down with the weak guys. Be a man and get a can of St. Pie.